welcome to That Anita Live, the talk show dedicated to providing personal development through emotional healing, through sharing to help you create a happier life. Today's episode is a lesson in history. How much do our ancestors tell us about ourselves? If you found out that your ancestor was a biracial madam in the early 1800s, would it boost, would it boost your self-esteem? It would boost mine. <laughs> James Nathan III and Brandon Massey are here to share with us the story of Melvina, the most notorious madam in Red River Valley. Ha! Who wants to start? <laughs> the book, it's, it's a book, the book was hot. So 1838, drop us in with Melvina and she is arriving in North Dakota. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Learning about Melvina, with her being a blood relative of yours, how did that make you feel? Um, it was kind of interesting because I didn't uh, expect it. It was, uh, the, that whole life was unexpected when we kind of uncovered it. And I didn't really believe it. Uh, I, I couldn't believe that a black woman of that time could actually make that much money and do the things she did mm -hmm. at that time. So it was still kind of a uh, So surreal. was it always kind of like an oral history family secret or? According to my cousin, uh, Sharon, she, I didn't know anything about this because we just discovered Melvina. Okay. So after she, we were talking, she, this was before we even found Melvina, she said, you know, I have uh, my uncle, Bay Brother, who's a descendant, he's a Massey also, mm -hmm. on, uh, before he passed away, he told her, you know, we have a madam in the family. And so she shared this with me and she called it, uh, I guess they call it kitchen table talk. Yeah. You know, <laughs> and uh, so like I said, when I heard it, I was like, uh, what <laughs> type of thing? And I was like, all right, you know, it, it might be possible. But I didn't really think it was, I didn't think it was possible for a black woman okay. at the time. So I was like, nah, I don't, I don't think so. Like if she was making money, wouldn't someone take it from her? Then like, what was the first thing that you came across that you discovered that made you sit back and go, wow? Um, I'd say it was, um, that we didn't, when we went into this, uh, my, my grand aunt knew only her grandmother's name. She didn't know her grandfather, so we didn't know Henry, we didn't know Melvina, we didn't know anybody. Okay. So without, without me looking for uh, Fascination Massey, who is, I think that's uh, Sharon's great grandmother, mm -hmm. without looking, f looking for her and then coming across Sharon, Sharon would have never told me that bit of history and I would have never se searched on it. Mm -hmm. So just the, just the way we came across each other because I decided to pick uh, one specific name to look at, Fascination Massey, you know, uh, against the, the other ones, that brought all this information. The reason we have this information, the reason James has written this book is because Sharon and I met because of her great-grandmother. Great Once the book was, re was released, <coughs> did it make you more proud of your family lineage? It made me, uh, I, I'd say uh, I was already proud of my family history. It just made me, uh, appreciate the fact that now we knew a lot more of it mm -hmm. and that and it made me a lot more interested in history in general you know you know you learn history in high school but this made it a little more real you know made it a little more tangible as you begin to do the co conduct the research and pull out these tidbits of information mm -hmm. what was one tidbit of information that you came across and you said no this can't be true um hmm i'd say one tidbit was that uh we saw um, one of the censuses, I think it was the 1900 census, that it marked uh, Melvina as being white. And even though it said she was white, I still didn't think about it. it. Like I didn't put the pieces together until James one day said, she was probably passing for white. And that's when it all fell into place. I was like, oh, that makes, all of this makes sense. <laughs> How she's able to get around this. And I never thought about it. Even with that staring me in the face, I was like, I just made a mistake. And James said, <laughs> you need to look at that and it's like, oh man. So how did you come into the picture once he began to research his family history? So once again, it's Sharon. Uh, Sharon Downey, I, we, we met online and then we met uh, in person uh, one Sunday afternoon in Rockville and we're sitting down and we're talking about my science fiction books, Okay. right? Mm -hmm. And then she says, I have a story and she's talking about how uh, they came together and they found Malvina. And then she's going through all these little tidbits of information about Malvina and uh, my brain is working and I'm thinking, wow, this is a book, this is 
this is Oprah, this is <laughs> Lifetime. I said, oh my goodness, this is well, great. What was the one thing that she said to you in that meeting that took you to that place? Um, without question, it was the fact that uh, the promissory note, okay? So we, uh, after she had served time uh, in 1900, uh, she gets out of jail and Melvina is, um, you know, just living life. Still went back to being a madam and everything. But the, the law is still after her, right? And so she's facing all kinds of different uh, lawsuits. Everybody's trying to take it to court for over some reason whatsoever. Okay. And so one of her attorneys, uh, one, of, one of her attorneys in one of the cases she wins, she pays him with the promissory note. The promissory note is for transactions that occur inside of her brothel, okay? So if he took that back to the brothel, well, he could get anything he wanted, okay? okay? In kind. So he takes that, smiles, and walks on, on by his way. Well, he used that same promissory note to pay off one of his debts. So that guy decides, well, I don't want that. I don't want what I can get in the brothel. I want cash. <laughs> he goes to Melvina and says, pay me cash. And Melvina goes, no, let's go to court. So she took him to court. The judge hears the case, both sides, and he sides with Melvina. And he tells the man, that promissory note is good, and it's good for anything you could get at the Crystal Palace. Case closed. <laughs> And that was the point that took you. That, when, when, I, when I heard that story, I said, okay, I'm in. <laughs> Let's go. <laughs> okay, so Melvina drops into <coughs> North Dakota. Mm -hmm. And she does what? Um, from what the records show, mm -hmm. um, initially when she came, she was the first, uh, she was the first madam in, Nor in Fargo, North Dakota. Uh, this is before it became a state. And we're talking late 1870s, early 1880s. Mm -hmm. And um, she's going to the most prestigious hotels and yada, yada, yada. Melvina was a very uh, extravagant, and flamboyant looking woman and she dressed accordingly um, from what we could gather. Um, she liked her diamond earrings, she liked her furs and minks, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, so, all of this plays right into what we were thinking and what we were believing that, okay, so she arrives from the East as far, and she says she's from Virginia. From all appearances, she's a white woman from Virginia. Who's gonna say no? So she sets up a business. Oh yeah. Um, what's interesting too about Melvina is that she's the only, there were plenty other madams in Fargo at the, at, during her time frame. Mm -hmm. But she's the only one that owned her property outright. She owned all of the brothels or all the, the boarding homes she owned outright. Any idea on when she landed in Fargo to begin to make the type of business moves that she did, she arrived with money. Mm -hmm. Yes. Where did she get that money from? Um, we're still trying to figure that out, but the mm -hmm. speculation mm -hmm. <coughs> is that she was a bootlegger and that she uh, as she went uh, during her long life in the in the sporting game uh, she picked up different things different tricks of the trade okay but one thing she that she really latched on to was bootlegging uh, North Dakota is a dry state right next to it is Minnesota Minnesota Moorhead is about three miles close proximity to Fargo. And Moorhead, Minnesota has 400 bars and pubs. That's the only thing it was known for, was just bars and pubs. Mm -hmm. So all of that drinking going on, you gotta supply them. And that's where I think Melvina was making her money, her cash. Bootlegging. Bootlegging. And owning the local brothel. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, what did you find most interesting? about Melvina's life? Um, just the fact that she could pull off these things. You know, you're, she's in the paper all the time, and there's, there's, I think there was an article about how the church, I don't know if the church was directly next door or somewhere down the street, but the water piping had to be connected to her house. Okay. So that was a big issue. And then I, I think I read somewhere that she actually paid for some of that to be done, or actually paid for it to be done. You know, and um, just the fact that she's able to get away with this, this lifestyle and just not be 
immediately thrown in jail. Okay, so let's let's you know? walk through, let's say her first her first court case, because she, she went to case she went to court a lot. A few times. It seemed as if she preferred to go to court than to argue with someone. Um. Well, Brandon brings up a good point, and so I'll I'll, I'll let's go back to this. This is right around our first, her first times in court mm -hmm. around 1870s, 1875 or so. Mm -hmm. So this is Reconstruction. Reconstruction is about to end that, by the way. So this is around this time period, and you gotta think to yourself, she's in her mid-30s by this time frame, and here's a young, independent black woman. Mm -hmm. Passing. Passing. Okay. But with money, with a lawyer on retainer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because she was going, she had no problem ever taking someone to court. Right. So she had money to do that. Um, in the East, I don't know if it was passing as much as they knew she was mulatto. Because in Virginia and DC and Maryland, you know, you could almost tell. You know, I don't know, uh, after a while, you get a feeling of, mm, yeah, you, you're not white, you're black, you know, or you're, you know, mixed. Uh, but the further west you went, Mm -hmm. The chances of that happening were slim to nil, especially in the Pacific Northwest in that area that she was in. Uh, not Pacific Northwest, but the, the, the middle west of the country, upper north tier, northern west. Uh, yeah, there's mostly people from Scandinavia. They, they so don't, you didn't see that. What was her first court case like? Who did she take to court? Um, I always get his initials mixed up. Lewis H.P. Davis, I believe. Lewis H.P. Davis. Uh, and Mr. Davis, uh, he's mulatto, he's mixed, and he is, uh, him and Melvina are dating, uh, courting, and uh, we believe they, they, were, they met sometime in Chicago. They met, they met outside of D.C. Uh, and he comes back to D.C. and he marries another woman who is a, a mulatto. Mm -hmm. And uh, Melvina finds out about this, and she starts harassing the woman, his wife, by sending her, uh, you know, different uh, letters in the mail, you know, mm -hmm. scandalous type stuff. So he gets tired of that and decides to take her to court. Okay, before they get to court, maybe give, give me one of the contents of the letter. Oh, I wish uh, I could. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, 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 <laughs> uh, I right. I, I've even asked for them, specifically from the, uh, some, some uh, mm -hmm. court uh, in DC. Mm -hmm. They said they don't have those anymore. They yeah, probably threw them out. That would have been good, but I. You married my husband. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You, you can just imagine how, how, in those days, how how, how that went. Mm -hmm. um, interesting though, uh, we we do have uh, letters from Henry uh, that that talks about uh, you know when he was trying to go through a divorce with his first wife, mm -hmm. and All right. uh, those were those were very. Interesting letters. Okay, so Melvina is mailing these uh, love notes mm. to the wife of the man that she thought she was going to marry. Correct. He has turned out marrying somebody else. Correct. Mm -hmm. And they go to court. Yes. How did they get into court? Um, so they, they, they go to court. Um, the judge hears them both out and basically just dismisses it and says, you, you settle this. You, you figure this out. But this is just a waste of our time. But, but by and large, she was suing him. Mm, mm -hmm. it's a counter suit. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So and you know, and judge just drops it all out. Uh, about a week later, uh, Melvina sues uh, Lewis Davis for a breach of promise. Right. So basically saying, hey, you promised to marry me. Uh, so. Either you do that, mm -hmm. <laughs> or, or we're going to let the judge court. side give me $5,000. Mm -hmm. So, um, and we, further research finds that Mr. Davis was a courier uh, for the then, which is the, 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 the treasury. So he was a courier, and he was working for uh, a, a retired uh, army colonel. Okay. So he wasn't making that much. And so the, our speculation is that when they... The judge basically said, told him to settle the thing out of court. Well, actually, they settled and it was dismissed. So they settled out of court. So I'm assuming that Melvina might have got fifty dollars from him, no more than maybe a hundred tops. Did they ever speak again? 
I doubt it. Not that we know. Okay, yeah, so I, was she ever dragged into court for running a brothel? A body house. Yeah, they never got dragged into court. They only got dragged to the the police station, I guess, to pay their quote unquote fine, which, which was funding the town. Which and the fine was the, I think it was 75 or 70 to 75 bucks. They'd find the, all the madams and they say, you know, go back to work and keep making us some more money. <laughs> yeah, you know? because um, the brothels funded all the, um, the services that you'd have for the county. So you'd have uh, trash pickup, mm. uh, you'd have livery stables, uh, you'd have the sheriff's department, his deputies, okay? All of that got funded by these illicit services. These mm -hmm. were the fines. Did she ever get dragged in for bootlegging? Now, uh, that's a different story, mm -hmm. okay? So they wanted to arrest her, and they sent her to jail for bootlegging. But what they caught her doing was basically a misdemeanor. She was selling or providing spirits to people in her boarding house. They never caught her for bootlegging, but that was the charge. Melvina, in the history of North Dakota, is the only one to ever, the last person to ever be arrested in that entire state ever for bootlegging. And this is all the way through prohibition, too, as well. Did she ever have kids? Outside of Henry? Um, there's speculation that mm -hmm. she may have had two other children. And that's just based on her um, when she was arrested and she said that. But other than that, we don't really know. Hmm. We don't really know. Miss Malvina, the madam of, of Fargo, North Dakota, we'll be right back to discuss more details <laughs> of her life. And what we believe happened to Malvina is that the biggest crime she committed that made her infamous in that whole valley region was the fact that she never told anybody she was black. And it came to light as how? That's anyway. An, yeah, yeah, that's another piece of speculation because, I mean, we don't really know what turned for her, but I mean, it's, it's, it is plausible that, you know, someone found out, and I know with uh, that Henry Ray case, when she took her, him to court, he probably would have said, you know, she's running a brothel and she's black and you guys didn't know. And it probably would have all been like, oh, we got to do something about that now. It's possible, but we don't know. We don't know specifically. Her husband was white. Hmm. From day to day, what was Melvina's life like? Oh, <laughs> man, that's, that's interesting. Um, I never gave that much pause thinking, simply because um, in the sporting life, if you're running a boarding house like that, it, it just depends. I mean, you could be up all night, all day, you know, so I don't know. I, I would think that um, when she's running the Crystal Palace, it was more than likely um, just entertaining guests, entertaining guests uh, throughout the day and evening. And was and bootlegging. <laughs> because what comes to mind is either Miss Kitty from Gunsmoke or um, Best Little Whorehouse of Texas that had Dolly Parton in it. Yeah. Um, it, she, she was the grand madame, mm -hmm. okay? So she made sure that people came in, they had a good time, they wiped their feet, da 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 da, da that type of thing. And in having a good time, did she have entertainers there? Oh, yes. Okay, mm -hmm. so she, she, give she, me that detail. She um, would import uh, musicians, uh, black musicians, to perform inside of the Crystal Palace. Okay. Oh, yeah. Oh, she did that. Oh, she, because the Crystal Palace in and of itself was something that was special in Fargo. It was supposedly, you know, just this grand place, you know. Um, I, you know, you really don't know because you don't have people that gave eyewitness accounts of being inside the Crystal Palace, mm -hmm. you know, and how, how it looked, but it was modeled after the Crystal Palace from Queen Victoria. Right, but in the book. Yes. In the book, I, 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 I give it this feel mm -hmm. of a, luxurious, high-end brothel uh, based on brothels in Chicago and D.C. of the time period okay. that were known to be this type of way, where they served champagne, uh, you know, you had nice, she had uh, uh, chefs and cooks come in through as well to mm -hmm. provide food for mm -hmm. them. So it, it was, it wasn't, 
it was in the hollow, which was the, the transient part of town, but it wasn't, you know, it wasn't like eating at Popeye's or anything like that. It was, you, know, <laughs> you, know, mm. you came there, you ate good, da da da, she entertained folks. It was a. Who were some of the entertainers that she had come through? I don't know. Um, any names that stick, stuck out that were, you know, big time people right. like that. It wasn't Louis Armstrong or anything like that. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. Right. I think some of the borders too, when you look at the city uh, directories and you see who's staying at her house, they will just say a musician here or some other guy here. So she had different people living at her house. And I think she used to, uh, I read someone, I can't even remember what it was, that the town wouldn't allow uh, black folks to stay in their hotels. So they would board with Melvina mm. at some point. But I gotta find out where that was written yeah. at. And it, it's interesting too. <coughs> the and, and by and large, uh, a lot of the, the city ordinances, I, I, it's amazing to me because there were other black madams in Fargo. She wasn't the only one. Uh, so that when they did find out that she was black, uh, I'm sure that clicked in the town as well. And they said, no wonder, <laughs> no wonder this is where black folks and, 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 and white folks are all living together, you know, you know, under the same roof. No wonder, you know. so. Uh, it, it, it's one of those things, uh, I remember reading this uh, thesis that someone had wrote saying that uh, the white prostitutes didn't work for black madams. Mm -hmm. And I found that to be odd. I'm like, mm, I, I, I think they worked for whoever, whoever, mm -hmm. whoever was Which, running the well, boarding house. Well, Melvina was passing, so it really didn't matter. Yes, it didn't matter for Melvina. So I, I was like, yeah, I, when you're a prostitute and you're in a boarding house, um, it doesn't matter who's running the boarding house, because if they tell you to go, then guess what? You're gonna be out on the street and you don't wanna be on the street. So the stagecoach pulls into town, mm -hmm. and the gentleman from the stagecoach goes over to the Crystal Palace, yep. run by Miss Melvina, mm -hmm. her ancestor. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Why <are> you? <laughs> 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 and they go in and Crystal Palace, of course, has to be a description because so I'm picturing Chandeliers. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, there's music playing. Yes. Um, they get to, to choose the entertainment of the evening. Yes. And then, any idea how much money she rolled during this time period that she was running this brothel? Um, I would say, once again, I would say that the brothels they made money, but. That wasn't where she made her, I mean, she had disposable income. Okay. Here's the, here's the anecdote. Mm -hmm. um, she builds the Crystal Palace and it burns down, burns down to the ground. Okay. She rebuilds that and refits it within a year and a half. So where? Yeah, exactly. Where's this right. money coming from? <laughs> right. But she Who arrives in Fargo with this money. Mama had money. So yeah, yeah. she had bank. So it wasn't like it so was, yeah, yeah, exactly. So I I I do believe that bootlegging. Uh, she's she's forty by the time she's really entrenched in, in Fargo as well. So I mean, she knows the tricks of the trade. She knows how to get some money. And every every property that these people are living in, she owns outright. So they're paying rent. They're working there and paying rent, up to her. So there's one thing that I, I think, uh, and we'll touch on this, and it's my speculation, that there's a, there's a big difference between the Melvina that is the legend and folklore okay. of the period and, and of the region, mm -hmm. and the historical Melvina. It's a big thing, diff difference. And the story in and of itself is different too. Uh, I believe that once they found out, there was a big backlash. And for the rest of her life, from, 19, oh, from 1900 to the rest of her life, 1910, 1911, they, you know, whatever they could stick it to her, they did. You know, back and forth. Okay, break that down. When you say stick it to her, what are some of the things that she went through? They constantly tried to get her on more bootlegging charges uh -huh. throughout that time period from from 1901 they tried to get her back they w even went to the extent of getting someone on a stand that was about to lie 
and he was about to lie under oath and then he forgot his lines mm -hmm. and told and said so out loud in the court mm -hmm. yeah yeah see yeah <laughs> so so it, it ain't a they all they, they say oh well you know she was a madam I says no they 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 were on the right track she was a bootlegger they just couldn't prove it a lot of the people prior to that that were supposed to show up for trial mm -hmm. to testify mm -hmm. they mysteriously disappeared they never showed up and each time she got dragged in she got dragged in for bootlegging for the most part okay it wasn't for yeah, prostitution it pro yeah no it was for bootlegging they knew they just couldn't prove it they don't know what she, they didn't prove what she was doing they could, just couldn't prove it but what i always would say is that she couldn't make any money in north dakota she was making money in Minnesota. So I don't know why the people in Minnesota weren't charging <laughs> bootlegger because she was bringing it, the booze through. I guess she was bringing the booze through North Dakota onto Minnesota and just selling it and popping it out from there. But I don't know. It's all speculation at this point because we don't have anything to back it up. Like it or not, our past does tell us a lot about ourselves. Make sure to research and document your history as far back as possible. There may be a big surprise of enlightenment in it for you. To reach out to James, find him on Instagram at? Uh, New York King MD. <laughs> to reach out to Brandon, <laughs> find him on Instagram at? Uh, no Instagram, but you can find us on Facebook at uh, uh, Massey Family. Uh, you can find us on Facebook. Yep. Get in okay. touch with us there. I'm Anita, your host. Be sure to check out thatanitalive.com for where and when to see our next episode. That's it.